Hey everyone, welcome back. Today we're going to be talking about the process that you go through when designing curriculum. And in my previous video, we were talking about competency-based education and training systems. Well, now I want to walk through what does a competency-based education and training, or CBET, C-B-E-T is the acronym that we see, what does that process look like from a stepwise perspective so that we know that we are focused on competency or occupational tasks, things that are done in the workplace and that are done routinely by workers to make sure that we are designing that curriculum to be relevant and in a meaningful way uh, for preparing people for the workforce. So let's uh, jump over to the PowerPoint and we'll continue on with our exploration of curriculum design. And welcome to the PowerPoint part of this presentation. So in our previous video, we were talking about what is CBET or competency-based education and training. And now we're starting to think about if we've built out the systems and we've built out the attitude within our institution that we want to do CBET, how do we go about designing CBET-oriented curriculum? And so we have a few different strategies that we need to integrate all together as part of this process. And this list here is my high-level strategies, and we'll dig into each of these one at a time here. But first off, we have to figure out what is that baseline worker skill? So who is our student coming into our program, and what sorts of skills, what sort of background do they have, so that when we're designing our curriculum strategy, we are meeting our students where they need to be when it comes to skills, when it comes to their... Um, their lifestyle as well. I think that's a, it's an important aspect to think about, especially in adult education, that uh, many of our learners are not traditional um, sitting in a classroom uh, at the same time every single week. They've got to have some sort of flexibility. Number two, we've got occupational task analysis, and this is a this is a deliberate uh, practice where we're going uh, by either doing on-site observation or semi-structured interviews with workers or we're interviewing employers and human resources specialists to figure out what are the tasks that that typical worker is doing on a routine basis. And we're then figuring out what is the criticality on those tasks. So if they were to do this task, do they need to do it exactly, precisely right? Everyone's going to say everything has to be done right. But... Uh, Certain tasks, especially in food safety and in food, uh, in food quality management, they are much more critical that, are, that they are done accurately to prevent catastrophe, so uh, foodborne illness or recall within the products. We need to think about the frequency that those tasks are done. So are these things that are done on a daily basis or are they done once a year? And as such, we then have to build it a priority on those occupational tasks. And then uh, jumping out to number three, in some cases, there are going to be national occupational standards and, or other voluntary occupational standards uh, that are developed by governments or sometimes by uh, colleges of practice within um, different disciplines. And in some cases, there are voluntary codes of practice or, or voluntary occupational standards that um, that they're being encouraged by the industry or encouraged by different um, professional organizations as being uh, valuable structures. And oftentimes these national occupational standards or professional industry group uh, occupational standards are part of accreditation models. And that, that's something that's worth discussing. We do want to have um, feedback cycles as part of continuous improvement with student, alumni, and industry so that we know what our relevant skills and uh, build out those program advisory committees or uh, curriculum advisory committees with students to know what's working and what uh, what needs to be improved within our within our classroom settings. Uh, we talked about this in the previous slideshow, but uh, bullet number five: innovative visioning of where the industry is evolving in the next five to ten years. And as subject matter experts and educators, we have a really important role to play. Um, in shaping how the industry functions, that 
uh, by teaching and changing the workforce and the 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 baseline of skills within that workforce, we can uh, gradually shift the capabilities of the industry. And so we need to think strategically, what are those skill sets? Last but not least, obviously, we need the input of educators and subject matter experts to say, here's what's important. Here's what needs to be taught. Here is the, the scientific or technological foundation behind what's out there. And this is why we need to be doing this. And, and so it's, as curriculum designers, you're using really all of these different skills mixed together. And so let's let's dig into each of these on a more granular basis. So let's figure out who, what is our baseline worker's uh, skill. And so we've got to think about who is that archetypal student coming into our program. And I realize there's no such thing as an archetype, but at the same time, there is. Usually within our academic programs, we're setting prerequisites to say, we would like our students to have these skills coming in. And so, for example, at our uh, programs in uh, food technology at Niagara College, we do require our students to have a grade 12 high school math and a grade 12 high school science course. And as such, it has been challenging because what we're finding is our archetypal student coming into the program is shifting. We've had a lot of... Uh, um, interest in the program because of COVID, many food service workers, people who've been working in restaurants or working as chefs or cooks or, or uh, restaurant uh, service people who have a strong interest in food are saying, wait a second, the restaurant sector is collapsed, but the food manufacturing sector is booming. How can I use my interest in food and my, my background in, in uh, understanding uh, food sales and food retail and uh, consumer dynamics, how can I use these really important skills? Or maybe as, as chefs, they know how to produce really beautiful plated product. How could they use that as a product development skill? Well, many of those people never took high school math or science because they thought, well, I'm going to go be a chef. And so how do we now reflect back and figure out uh, pathways for these individuals? Food science programs uh, run the gamut in that some food science programs are targeted towards traditional post-secondary university pathways with heavy science and mathematics. Um, but we know that there's a strong demand for general labor uh, process operators and um, technical operators such as bakers or cheesemakers or meat processors. Um, and that may not be attracting the same people who are uh, taking advanced level high school math and science who think that they may be going into engineering or advanced science fields. And so are we building out the right baseline with our curriculum so that we are fulfilling the workforce needs? We do need to reflect about what are the jobs that our, our graduates are going to be going in on completion of studies because no program can be all things to all industries. And so Within our food science programs, uh, for example, in Canada, we have food science programs that emphasize different aspects. So uh, some of our friends at Conestoga College, for example, have programs that are emphasizing operations management. And that is a really important skill set. And it's a very different skill set than product development, which is what we emphasize a lot at Niagara College. We also at Niagara College emphasize a lot in food safety management, and it's um, partly because of my own bias, uh, having worked in food safety inspection and compliance prior to joining the college, but also it's because of the, the uh, foundational aspect of food safety that if I want to go into logistics or I want to go into supply chain management or operations or product development, food safety is one of those foundational skills that's going to be transformative across all of those disciplines. So we do need to think about what are those jobs that are Students are going to be entering immediately after graduation, but we also don't want to just teach to immediately after graduation. We want to think a little bit about that stretch goal into the next two to five years and prepare the students with the skills so that they can mature into those careers without having to go out for extensive retraining. We have to, we have to be really deliberate when we're talking to our students to say, you are not going to get that management position that you're you're going to uh, most likely land in five years, but we're going to give you some management skill sets so that if this is something that's interesting to you, you know that these skills are there and 
you can start to have that dialogue or build that career progression for yourself. So we've got to both think about the immediate nature of the student as well as that future state of the student and the longer term future state of the student so that we build out appropriate tasks at the baseline, build out the appropriate uh, zone of proximal development within our curriculum so that we can sequence our courses and sequence out all those tasks that we're going to be describing. Then we're going to jump into occupational task assessment. And I will have yet one more PowerPoint coming up in, um, in this series where we talk more about the uh, writing of occupational tasks, but we need to go out into the workforce and start to ask the question, what does that typical worker do on the job? And how we go about this could be done through a, a wide variety of different means. You could go out and do observation of people in the workforce. That's challenging because you really, you can't sit there all day long and watch and watch and watch. What's more common is you'll, uh, interview uh, different stakeholders at different career levels. Oftentimes for schools that have established alumni base, they'll interview uh, past alumni to say, what are skills that are important to you, perhaps through uh, survey tools or um, hosting networking events uh, for graduates. That way you can, you can start to figure out what are people doing on the job? you then have to start asking the question, how frequently are you doing these different tasks? Are you doing these tasks every single day? Are you doing them multiple times a day? As if you're doing tasks and you're seeing a high level of frequency, then that's something that you want to be prioritizing within your curriculum, both from a delivery perspective, but also a mastery perspective to make sure that people have mastered that skill set and are, are going to be able to um, use it in a meaningful way for their employer. Um, then there's the aspect of criticality on that task. In that certain task, if, if you make a mistake, it's not got a huge consequence. Well, in, um, in other situations, such as food safety, um, you need to know that, that you are doing this and you have to have mastery on that skill set. If you don't master it, you shouldn't do it at all because it gives a false sense of uh, security with respect to your ability to deliver food safety programs to the company. So you've got to know that criticality on the task. This is uh, common across a wide variety of dom domains. So occupational health and safety tasks, for example, do the, do the food science students know about lockout tagout, for example? It's not just food safety, it could be other aspects of occupational health and safety or um, things that could cause devastation to the company or to the, to the worker. Um, there are other aspects of what we call essential employability skills. Um, the Conference Board of Canada developed uh, an essential employability skills matrix, and since then, Employment and Social Development Canada has done some additional uh, permutations of that matrix. But the idea being, do our um, when we're thinking about those occupational tasks, are we thinking about other aspects of employability? So, good communication skills ability to work in a team, having good literacy and numeracy skills, having um, emotional intelligences towards oneself and towards the world around them. Those are not necessarily domain specific to food science or to other um, technological domains. Those are transferable across any sort of workplace environment. And how are we integrating that into the occupational task assessment is also important. When are we seeing those um, team working skills? I'm, I'm looking at this photo here of Amico and Caffelli making vegan poutine and <laughs> doing some good teamwork there. That was a fun day. <laughs> those two were really great fellows in their class. Um, I mentioned this in the previous slideshow. In certain countries, there are national occupational standards or and, and sometimes they're developed by the government, and in other cases they are developed by professional associations or um, colleges of um, professions. Um, I put up a photo here of the HACCP Coordinator National Occupational Standard that was developed by Food Processing Skills Canada. I happen to be on the committee that helped develop this occupational standard. But uh, the idea being that um, when you develop an occupational standard, in essence, 
it's a committee that has come together to do the occupational task assessment. They've come together and done that consensus for the education sector or for the human resources um, divisions of the industry, or even just for students directly so that they can go through and benchmark their skill sets independently. But if you've got access to these national occupational standards, it's fantastic that you, you may already have a framework against which you can design your curriculum. That said, you have to go in and re remind yourself about those aspects of taxonomy. Is the taxonomy sufficient for the level of development that your student needs? Are they going to have mastery on that um, domain and that learning outcome that's within the occupational standards such that they will be successful on the job? That is important. I've seen lots, uh, I, I like the Food Processing Skills Canada occupational standards. Partly I'm biased because I helped write many of them, but partly I like the fact that there's a really strong emphasis on that taxonomy and a really strong emphasis on consensus. There are other taxonomies out there where the, um, or pardon me, there are there other voluntary occupational standard frameworks that are used for accreditation um, within different uh, professional organizations. And the taxonomy is really, really low. And it's somewhat concerning that as an educational institution, you look at that taxonomy and say, well, it's, it's low taxonomy for accreditation, therefore I'm going to teach to low taxonomy because that's all that's necessary for the accreditation. And that that's, uh, I want to say, it's a bit of a challenging scenario. It's easy to teach to low taxonomy and it takes less effort, but are you preparing your students for the workforce in a meaningful way by doing that? Don't just teach to the occupational standard reflect and remind yourself that all of these different elements are essential for curriculum design. You do want to have aspects of student, alumni, and employer feedback. This is a photo of a program advisory committee meeting that we were hosting in Vietnam. Um, and we had brought in the members of the industry to talk about what are the tasks that workers are doing. And we can actually see the DACOM chart, uh, design a curriculum chart that we had built out on the wall back there of all the different learning outcomes and building consensus of those learning outcomes through this committee. We were doing gap analysis, talking to these employers about what skills were important for the workers, what skills were most useful, what skills perhaps that we were teaching weren't as useful um, and, or meaningful within their work environments. Were we missing any skills that were really uh, critical for the success of graduates as they were joining different companies. And having this sort of uh, gap analysis is really meaningful when designing curriculum. Of course, we also want to make sure that we have some sort of student feedback for continuous improvement to make sure that we are creating purposeful activities. For example, you'll often get students coming in uh, for me as an academic program coordinator, I, I, I do a lot of subject matter negotiation and, and uh, coaching and mentoring of faculty members. And you get students coming in grumbling saying, this teacher used a multiple choice exam over and over and over again. And, I, and, and, and I'm like, so fantastic. Um, multiple choice when done well can be a meaningful and uh, very effective rapid assessment tool within the classroom. Um, but at the same time, if you're only relying on multiple choice, that can be that can be dangerous. What other sorts of meaningful and purposeful activities are creating relevance of that curriculum within the classroom setting? And so having these sorts of opportunities for continuous improvement are really vital as part of that CBET framework and as part of your curriculum design. Of course, we've mentioned this before, the idea of having innovative visioning where the industry is evolving and so what are those future skills needed by the workforce? And how is our curriculum responding to that? Um, for example, we know in Canada, we're seeing a lot more, um, a lot more deliberation and a lot more integration of automation and process controllers within the food manufacturing system. So uh, for example, using SCADA type systems, you can, uh, or, or programmable logic controllers, you can, you can uh, be running real time quality assurance on your product and collect reams and reams of data. But how do you turn that data into action? Well, uh, at Niagara College, we had been um, having our students take a calculus course because we felt it was good for um, 
the, the, the mental discipline of the mathematics, but we found that very few students were applying any calculus concepts in the workplace, whereas they were doing a lot more data analysis and statistics to be able to do statistical process control and manage the large amounts of um, internet-connected uh, manufacturing systems, we decided to shift our curriculum uh, uh, and we finally made the, uh, the formal decision and we'll be implementing it this upcoming uh, academic calendar. But uh, now our students are going to be taking um, statistics and data analysis instead of calculus. Because again, we see that workforce trend and we needed to make sure that we were responding in a meaningful way so that we're not diminishing the mental discipline of mathematics within our program. We are instead shifting the mathematical emphasis towards um, relevant data analysis methods that are going to be more commonly used in the industry. And the students were quite pleased to hear about this because they want to know that everything that uh, everything that they're investing time-wise and effort-wise in the classroom is going to reap them some sort of return on investment when it comes to the workforce. So that's an example of us doing some prediction on what our curriculum needs to be so that we're transforming the sector moving forward. Then, of course, we've got to have our subject matter experts and educators out there. And I always, I always, uh, um, I've got a photo here, and this uh, in the center of the photo here is my good friend uh, Sarvjit Bamra, and she's one of our professors at Niagara College. She's a she's a wonderful food food safety educator and a guru in terms of HACCP and preventive control education. And having her on our team was transformative. I mentioned in the previous um, PowerPoint how we, we took a transformative mindset about how we could teach food safety rather than teaching it as, a, as an advanced taxonomy towards the end of the program. We said, we need the students to repeat this so much so that they have mastery and they're able to use it in reflexive ways um, that are much higher rigor relevance and that's going to be transformative for the industry. And so having our educators as, as uh, key leaders in that transformation is really, really important. I always warn against table of contents teaching. Um, it's so tempting, especially for new teachers who maybe don't have a lot of curriculum in front of them to go into They'll find a textbook, they'll say, hey, look, I'm going to select out 12 chapters, one chapter a week, and we're going to just go through and regurgitate that, um, that content. I always hazard against that table of contents teaching style and instead really think about what are those occupational tasks and use some of those other tools that may be available to you, like occupational standards, to help frame what you need to teach. We do need to make sure that student-centered learning practice is absolutely foundational. I love having all these photos of our education community and our students out doing stuff together because um, in CBET type frameworks, we really are focused on that application and getting out there as fast as possible doing stuff and uh, seeing how it functions in the work world is, is so important for us. So that stu student-centered learning practice is absolutely foundational in everything that we're doing. So from a curriculum design perspective, we are taking all of these different types of observations, and that's where we now have to hone in and say, I've got to deliver a course. What does that look like? How am I going to design that? Well, I think that is my next uh, PowerPoint moving forward. Oh, here's us doing more student-centered learning as well. This was a really fun day. We had a we had a work integrated learning experience where um, a company came to us and said we want to do some product innovation within within this certain category. Um, can we do an innovation exercise with you? And I said absolutely. Let's let's engage all of these students in this process. And I, I call it the the day of the wall of cake. The students were out there designing all sorts of different products using uh, cake ingredients. Um, and they were drawing and using a different uh, using different matrices um, that we had designed, knowing exactly what their pantry staples were going to be. They could recombine them into meaningful uh, formats. And then we did a prioritization exercise. And as much as this was about helping a local company, 
the students were able to then see how does innovation praxis work within the classroom. It was a really meaningful exercise and everyone was super engaged in the entire process and you can just see how much enthusiasm is on everyone's face from that day. Um, but thinking about all of those different dimensions of student-centered praxis and uh, going as high and as fast as possible to high-level taxonomy activities, this, this activity was extremely meaningful when it came to understanding what the product development process looks like. And there's another Dakin process. I, I, I just uh, really enjoy thinking about curriculum design. And uh, those of you who are um, fans of Niagara College will see uh, two of my mentors who in um, epistemology and learning about the learning process, Bev Davies and John O'Grislow. Um, they have been wonderful mentors to me throughout my career development. And we also might see our friend uh, Kyla Penny, who is our manager of international programs, but this is from the Vietnam for, uh, Vietnam Skills for Employment Project, and you can see how complex our occupational task assessment was. As we're going through that brainstorming process, every time someone had an occupational task come up, it, sh it showed up on our huge wall, and then we started organizing those into core themes and clustering them in together into uh, core topics, and then we were able to go through and do a prioritization exercise to say, hey, each of these occupational tasks and each of these uh, knowledge or skills or attitudes that are necessary in that workforce, how are we going to cluster them together into, into course themes? And so we worked on this. Um, you can just see how much effort, but how much pride there is from all of the people who participated in this process. It was just a, a really worthwhile activity um, to be doing this um, design of curriculum together as a food science community and to really hone in on what were modern and innovative practices that would be necessary to help grow the uh, food manufacturing sector in, in South Vietnam. So from here we've got those, those course descriptions, we've clustered out those themes and then we're breaking down those tasks into learning outcomes and learning objectives. So each of those tasks, we often will call them learning objectives. Sometimes you'll hear the term elements of performance, but these course learning objectives then become those, those touch points that you need to show that you can demonstrate and apply and um, those, those individual tasks broken down so that it all accumulates back into this, this, this core theme of what that course description is going to be. And so I think... Actually, I'm going to stop here and uh, stop with my uh, celebration of all these wonderful uh, food science professionals and education professionals. And I'm going to uh, do a third PowerPoint for you where we start to talk about once we've done all of this task assessment, what does it look like as we go through the, um, the, the course outline design process? All right. So you are... Always encouraged to ask lots of questions. Uh, those of you know, I'm a, I'm a practitioner of W. Edward Deming's uh, principles of management, and one of his key philosophies was to ask good questions, to not be um, not be afraid in that process, and to participate in continuous improvement and learning for your own for your own enjoyment. I just love learning, and I love uh, sharing knowledge with other people. So. Feel free to ask questions anytime and we'll talk to you again real soon about uh, more stuff about curriculum design.